Writer Matthew Thomas chronicles the shift of working class voters leaving the Democratic Party from 2008 to 2020, but notes that Team Blue captured more of America's affluent voters than ever before. In this example, you can see the distribution of votes in Democratic presidential primaries in 2008 versus 2020. Counties where the median household income is under 60000 a year went from contributing 35% of the vote in 2008 to just 28% in 2020. In contrast, counties with a median household income of above 80000 increased from 24% in 2008 to 30% in 2020, with about half of that growth in counties where the median household income is above $100,000 a year. However, these trends were not uniform across every state. Author of Vulgar Marxism newsletter, Matt Thomas, joins us now to break down the data. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you for having me. So how should we understand this? More uh, affluent people are voting, fewer, less affluent people are voting. What's driving these trends? Um, well, that's, um, I guess the trend, first of all, is both uh, more affluent people are voting as a share of the Democratic primary electorate and as an absolute number, and fewer working class people are voting as a share of the primary electorate and as an absolute number. So one the common theme that we see in, in multiple states is that where, you know, these trends are not being driven simply by the party growing in more prosperous or affluent areas, you know, just adding voters, um, but there's actually, um, voters are dropping off in, in poorer areas. Uh, so for example, in Tennessee, middle class counties went from around 30 percent of the vote to 38 percent of the vote um, and increase and the raw vote total in those counties increased by more than 50,000 um, but counties that um, uh, are the poorest in the state went from around 65 percent of the vote to 55 percent of the vote and the drop off there was by more than 120,000 so we see that in certain states um, like Virginia, for example, where there's a high concentration of affluent professionals, um, these trends have been really great for turnout because most of the population is highly educated and affluent. Um, and so there's been a huge explosion in turnout in Virginia in the Democratic presidential primary since 2008. Um, but almost everywhere else, since most states are not rich, um, uh, turnout has declined precipitously. Um, and you know, what's driving the trends? I think that there's competing explanations for that. Um, some people uh, attribute, you know, the cultural politics of uh, the liberal professional class um, as um, they say that they're toxic among voters without a college degree. I think that's true. Increasingly, you're seeing, you know, I think that these trends are most dramatic in the South. So I think that, you know, 50 years after the Southern strategy, you're still seeing non-college whites in the South moving away from the Democratic Party. Um, in Virginia, in Southwest Virginia, you know, um, 10 years ago, even if the Democrats were winning 20, 25 percent of the non-college white vote, they're net, um, down there. Now they're winning 10 to 15. Um, and so there's still bleed happening among non-college whites, but increasingly what we're seeing is um, non-college non-whites, um, especially um, Hispanic and Asian voters, um, uh, drifting rightward as well. So I think it's uh, multiple factors, but it's it's not good news for um, you know the coalition uh, of the Democratic Party uh, fr from its from the point of view of its capacity to run on a working class agenda. So, so let's say, you know, you're advising the Democratic Party. Would you say that, well, you have to, you know, you have to get back some of these voters, so you have to focus on issues they care about, working class issues. You have to be quieter or less radical on sort of the cultural issues that animate, you know, the, the highly educated, younger um, uh, kind of staffer or, or wealthy class. Or do you say, we've already lost these voters, we have to turn out more and more affluent people, we have to, you know, uh, uh, those still remaining in the Republican Party, we have to win them over, uh, you know, what is, the, what is the strategy? I mean, I think it's really difficult. One point that I make in the piece is that, you know, you have these competing explanations. Basically, you have this faction among people that would be identified as belonging to, like, the Democratic establishment or associated with more centrist politics who want the party to move to the center on culture. Um, it's kind of difficult because the party obviously, you know, at the at the commanding heights of it, there has been a huge disavowal of uh, certain kinds of left wing cultural politics or uh, politics that are tagged as being related to the culture war, um, uh, especially around issues of like race and policing. Um, but there's still this huge faction within the party which pursues this kind of like, 
you know, social justice infused vernac um, policies, that, but also this kind of vernacular and aesthetic, which a lot of people find very off putting, you know, um, that's associated with the party, even if it isn't, you know, in control of it. Um, and then you have this other faction, which basically says you need to move to the left in economics. Um, and it points out um, the party's, you know, commitment to neoliberalism really since, um, you know, post 70s, and then really, you know, coming into its own in the 90s after it actually takes power and governs as a party. Uh, on a neoliberal agenda at that time, you know, as a, you know, I'm a, you know, it's called vulgar Marxism for a reason. I'm on the left. Uh, that has been my critique for a long time. Um, but a point that I make in the piece is that these trends are really deep seated. I mean, the party, I go through the, in the piece, the history of the party's pursuit of the professional class beginning in the 70s, mid 70s to today. You know, the party pursued these voters as the white working class started to move to the right in the 1960s and 70s. Um, after, our, you know, Nixon pursued the Southern strategy and after the Democratic Party became associated with, you know, civil rights in the post-60s uh, era. Um, and so this is a trend that is long in the making. These are um, trends that have been going on for decades. And I think that, you know, even if the party were to choose a strategy, an effective strategy at the moment, it would be very, it could potentially take a long time to see any returns on that, given how long they've been pursuing, you know, a more affluent demographic. Yeah, Matt, I agree with your critique of the Democratic Party abandoning the working class in pursuit of neoliberalism, but I'm curious whether or not part of the strategy has to be, you know, re revealing the extent to which the Republican Party is using these culture wars as a substitute for any, you know, working class agenda of their own, and how you go about that project when it seems like engaging in any of these culture war issues at all fuels the beast and really has you on the, the playing field, on the footing of talking about things that are not the material economic issues that could potentially motivate working class voters across the board. Yeah, and I think it, I don't know, there's something about the party of Democrats in general where tactically, I, you know, I think that, I don't know what it is, but they don't seem to understand that they're in the business of politics mm -hmm. um, or they just don't have that kind of knack for, I don't know, performance or the theatrics of politics, or I don't know what it, and maybe that's also a part of the sort of changing nature of the class base too. You don't have people that have that kind of retail politics, I don't know, what performance are uh, bone in them. Um, whereas you have so many of those uh, on the right, or at least it feels that way. And so I think a lot of Democrats, um, I don't know, I just think there's almost something in the air in the water um, on the center left um, and in the party where they're spooked by the right. They're not confident. And I also think it's maybe perhaps that they don't have a clear agenda or program that they're running on. They're just anti-Republican um, or they are, you know, they're, I mean, they're the party of the status quo. I think, unfortunately, one dynamic that we're in is that you have all the energy is on the right. Like they, for whatever reason, like feel confident, you know, they're empowered by uh, the counter-majoritarian institutions that we have in this country. Um, there's a lot of energy on uh, the far right, the reactionary right, and they really feel like they're in the driver's seat culturally and politically, even though they're not technically in power right now, although they will be soon. Um, and I think the Democrats just don't want that to be the case. They're the party of the status quo, they're the party of the broken institutions that we have. And and when you don't have a clear agenda of program, it's hard to sort of get that fire in your belly and to really offer people something. So I think that that really handicaps them um, when it comes to um, offering something as an alternative to people. Yeah, I like the idea that the Democrats need more country preachers and, and fewer McKinsey analysts or something doing their messaging campaign. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much for uh, joining us uh, today, Matt. Thanks, you guys. Next on Rising, Nevada candidate for Congress, Amy Vilela, de details why she believes the status quo is no longer working for the people in the state's first district. Stay tuned.